<clears throat> we're going to get started tonight, but the Pete's not able to make it, so uh, we're not going to have any uh, congregational, <clears throat> uh, and so uh, kind of a last minute thing there. So uh, we're going to open up with prayer requests. Any prayer requests tonight? And uh, any prayer requests? Yes, Chrissy. Okay, uh, somebody Chrissy knows named Joanne uh, lost her son going through some issues with her job. So pray for Joanne as her name. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, anyone else tonight? Yes, Carl. Okay. Okay, Carl has having an MRI on the 15th, and so uh, pray for him. Did you send me a friend request this week on Facebook? <laughs> okay, good. I, well, what I do, if, when someone uh, friends me on Facebook, I usually wait a few days before I accept it, even if it's a first time, uh, because uh, not knowing if it's, if it's a fake or something. And so I, I accepted it, so that's why I'm like, I, I'm praying that it was you. It's okay, good, it was you. <laughs> Oh. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, so Carl having an MRI on the fifteenth. Um, anyone else? Yeah, Ron. Okay. So pray for. Oh, took it away from you. Yeah, he ended up calling me at the last minute and he was like, taking out of it because he said I had it. And then, uh, so I'm still on that one day a week. I know my last day is six weeks now. I kind of was like, oh, okay. 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 So um, let me write this down, and I'll repeat it. <laughs> okay, so uh, somebody uh, named Timmy <coughs> Miss, for Missy uh, is praying for somebody named Timmy, uh, Ron's job, and uh, Ron's sister, Chrissy uh, Gosner. Gosner? G-O-S-S-E-R. G-O-S-S-E-R, okay. Chris, Chrissy Goster, Goster, sorry. And uh, pray for her with cancer and... Uh, just uh, not uh, apparently not doing well there. So, uh, so <coughs> uh, continue to pray. Now, um, w I mean, with that, Ron. I mean, Lord willing, she's got a long time. But I've, I have people who ask me to do their funeral all the time, and they don't have anything underlying going on. So, Lord willing, the Lord will give her uh, some more time there. Um, any anyone else? I saw more hands. Mr. Weaver. Okay, Nikki Weaver. Okay. Okay, for surgery. Uh, yes, Mrs. McVeigh. Pastor Keith and Cynthia and his wife Cynthia Taylor with COVID down in Florida and uh, re recovering from COVID. So uh, continue to pray for them there. Uh, anyone else? Um, pray for Bill Webb. He uh, put on Facebook that he, which I talked to him the other day, he said he was getting an MRI, and so he went down, and so it, I guess it's a couple days uh, down at the VA, so it's a couple days before he gets his results. So he's had a lot of issues, pain in his legs, and uh, so he can't sleep very well at night, he said. So uh, pray for Bill Webb that uh, whatever comes back in the MRI, that, <coughs> that they'll be able to uh, give him some kind of a comfort. He's um, he's in his upper, is he in his upper 80s, Bob? Is that somewhere? He's in his upper 80s, and so 
um, uh, would, you know, when you when you get up into that age group, they don't like to do much, you know, uh, in, especially in regards to surgeries and things because of the because uh, of the high risk. And so, uh, just pray for Bill Webb. He's he wants to just uh, preach until the Lord calls him home. He's he's uh, he's a he's a fireball, and so uh, pray that the Lord will allow him to do just that. Um, anyone else tonight? Prayer. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, pray for. I've got. I had a call earlier where somebody. Um, somebody who's being moved to hospice uh, over off Beachmont, Five Mile. And so uh, they asked, they, they listened. They've never been to our church. They asked, they listened to our messages online, uh, but asked that uh, I would go out and see them. They're, uh, she's being, uh, take, she, they're going to take her there tonight, sometime tonight. And then, uh, so I'm going to go over in the morning. She asked that I would come and pray with her. Um, it's, just, it's just kind of interesting through the COVID. Um, I'm, She's never been here in her life, but I'm basically her pastor on TV, <laughs> on on the uh, the social media. And so, uh, but no, hey, you know what? I'm just I, I share that to say the Lord can use the media for good. And so, uh, so I'm going to go and meet this lady for the first time and and pray with her. Probably the first and the last time I'll get to pray with her. So, uh, obviously, I say that to pray as I. Uh, it's always uh, people will ask me uh, if the Lord, you know, go visit my family member. And if the Lord opens up the door, give the gospel. And I say, well, the Lord always he is the door and the door always opens up when I go. <laughs> uh, we make sure the door opens to give the gospel. And so uh, that's what I want to do. If I don't know if they're saved or not, but we're going to going to find out tomorrow. So, uh, all right, well, let's pray and uh, we'll get into I'm excited about the Bible study tonight. Let's 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 bow our heads together. <clears throat> now, Father. In heaven, Lord, we do thank you so much for your holiness and, Lord, the, the fact that you're holy and you're righteous and you're also gracious and merciful. Uh, Lord, as we lift up these folks here tonight, quite a few people, uh, different situations and, uh, Lord, different burdens, different heartaches. And, uh, Lord, why it's actually on my mind and uh, as I think about uh, someone who wasn't mentioned tonight, but I think about Cecil, who's uh, started in on his radiation just this week. Uh, Lord, uh, as I just saw the picture of him on online right before he went he just he's not looking good lord i pray that you would give him strength and through all this with his cancer uh lord i know it's just taking so much out of him lord i pray uh that you would <clears throat> excuse me continue to give him strength lord that he would be able to recover we want to see him make a full recovery and lord we ask and we petition of that tonight lord please heal him up and uh, help him he's such a young guy and uh lord i pray that you give him strength there uh, Lord, for Joanne, who is uh, a nurse and lost her son and uh, just struggling with her job and what to do, uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just guide there, Lord, and give her uh, just peace and whatever decision she needs to make and decides to make, Lord, I pray that she would just have a peace about it. Uh, Lord, we know that you'll meet her needs. Lord, for Carl and his MRI, I pray for all to go well. Uh, Lord, that he wouldn't need uh, any heart surgery. And for Bill Webb, uh, I pray that his MRI uh, results would come back and everything would be okay there. Uh, for uh, for Missy's uh, friend, Timmy, Lord, you know the need. For Ron, <coughs> who's uh, looking for a job, Lord, I know that he's got quite a few th uh, uh, applications out to different places. Lord, I ask for uh, for him to have the right one. I know that it's sometimes discouraging uh, as one falls through, uh, but Lord, uh, you know what he needs. You know what's the right job for him. I pray that you would uh, provide that for him and his family. Uh, Lord, for Ron's sister, uh, Christy Gosser, Lord, I, I, I pray that you would continue to just touch her body, Lord. We'd love to see her just cancer-free, uh, but Lord, you know what you want for her. And Lord, I pray that uh, Ron would be an encouragement, that the family would just be an encouragement to her, uh, whatever your will is there. Uh, Lord, for uh, Nikki Weaver, uh, the Weaver's uh, family member there, I pray for uh, everything to go well there. For Keith and Cynthia Taylor, uh, with COVID, I pray you would heal Pastor Keith up, <clears throat> Pastor Keith Taylor, uh, that he would be able to just uh, serve his church and get back to uh, his regular uh, pastoral duties there at that church. Lord, for uh, Lord for our church, we thank you. I thank you for all those who have continued to return. And Lord, I pray that we would continue to see others who have not been able to make it back to return uh, back to Lighthouse Baptist Church. Lord, I pray uh, tonight as we open up the Word of God, I pray that it would be a help to us as we go through the Bible study Lord, that we would leave here uh, with, uh, Lord, just encourage the word of God. And Lord, uh, we just give you all the praise for what you're going to do. Thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. And Lord, we just love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> all right, because um, it, was, it was a last-minute thing on the music. 
Uh, we're not going to have music tonight, so forgive me if, if you're, I know different people, they, that's, that's like half of the reason they're here is, uh, to get, is the saying, uh, but uh, that's just where it's at. So Galatians chapter number two with me, if you would. Galatians chapter number two. <coughs> Excuse me. Galatians chapter number two. And give you just a few moments to get over to there. And so, <clears throat> Galatians chapter number two. And uh, I'm, I'm preaching tonight on a, on, on a subject that um, over the past probably two months I have kind of touched on. And when I went back and just prayed about it a little bit more and uh, studied on a little bit more, I thought, you know what? Um, I'd like to give a little bit more on that. And so, that's what we're doing. Galatians chapter number two. And I want us to look at two verses. Two verses. Galatians chapter number two. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to look uh, at two verses. Verses number 19 and 20. And if you would look with me uh, in verse number 19, the Bible says, For I through the law am, what's that word? Say it with me, class. What's that word? Dead. Okay, I just want to make sure that you're with me. For I through the law through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Now this is very interesting because he says in verse number 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, we've talked many, many times, we've seen in the scripture where the Bible says that we are to die to self, uh, we're to die daily. Uh, Jesus talked about that, about following him, taking up your cross. If you're going to be a, a disciple of his, and you're going to have to take up a cross, and you're going to have to die daily and follow him. And so we, we know that the Bible says that, but sometimes when we think about dying, uh, we don't like that word. We don't like the word death. We don't like dying. Uh, we know that as Christians that we are never going to die spiritually, but physically this body is uh, going to uh, expire someday if the Lord doesn't come back first. We know that. And so this body is going to go back into the ground, and, uh, and so our physical body is going to die, but spiritually uh, we are not going to die. And so <clears throat> Paul describes uh, uh, that his, his permanently changed uh, relationship to the law. And look at verse number 19 once again. For I through the law am dead to the law. I through the law am dead to the law. You see, Paul made a, a, a statement here and he says that he had died to the law. And it's very, very interesting when we think about that because if he was dead to the law, then it was impossible for the law to be the way that he stood to be accepted by God. You see, a lot of people are relying, the world, the lost world, is relying on their goodness. They're relying on how they have obeyed in order to get them good standing with God and ultimately get them acceptance and entrance into heaven. Well, we know that that's not the case. And beyond just having a verse saying, uh, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is very, very clear on that, that we are not working our way to heaven. It's not going to do any good. But if I could say, this is exactly what we're talking about right here in verse number 19, for I through the law am dead to the law. Notice that it wasn't the law that was dead. It wasn't the law that was dead. The law reflects in its context here the holy heart and character of God. There was nothing wrong with the law. It wasn't the law that died, but Paul died to the law. I'm not trying to oversimplify this, but I want to make sure that it is very, very simple. <laughs> Uh, I remember Brother Fox, Dr. Rick Fox, t uh, teaching me that when I was coming down to start uh, the church. I remember him saying, uh, he said, he said, he said, Brother Lang, he said, I work hard at making the gospel simple. I remember sitting there thinking about that. I'm like, is that a bragamony or is that? No, he said, he said, it wasn't bragging. What he was saying was we should, our goal when we're teaching, those of you who are Sunday school teachers, when we're teaching, our goal is ultimately to make it 
simple so that the, everyone else could understand what we're saying. <laughs> we're not to get up there and give a bunch of fancy words for the sake of giving fancy words. We're not up there to try to show how much knowledge we have, but we're there to reflect what the Bible says and make sure that we do that so that our audience understands what's going on. Uh, so I said that uh, it wasn't the law that was dead, it was, <clears throat> it was uh, which, which is reflecting God's character and his, and his holiness, uh, and, and the fact that the law, uh, there was nothing wrong with the law in and of itself. So how did Paul die to the law? He said, I, through the law, <clears throat> in verse 19, am dead to the law. The law itself, if I could say this, killed Paul. It, it showed him that, that he never could live up to the law and, and fully uh, to its holy standard. And the reality is, none of us can, in our own selves, live up to the law. We can try, but it's not going to happen. For a long time before Paul knew Jesus, he, he thought God would accept him because of keeping the law. He, he even said, he said, I lived a Pharisee of the straightest sect. He, he, he knew the law. He studied the law. He obeyed the law. Uh, it, it's absolutely amazing when we think about it. Uh, Paul, as a Pharisee, kept the law greater than many who were saved. <laughs> If you think about it, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting when you think about it that way. Uh, but with all of that, he came to the point where he really understood the law uh, as, as, as in regards to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he understood this. When this came about to him, he realized that the law made him guilty before God. Did you get that? The law made him guilty before God, not justified before God. A lot of people are using the law. Here we go. We have the law uh, and I'm keeping it. So therefore, uh, I'm good and good standing with God. Well, no, uh, the Bible says that it is our schoolmaster. <clears throat> and the reality is this was something uh, that showed him and revealed. It was a mirror to him showing the law was there to reveal himself of what he truly was. It wasn't to be used as a stepping stone to get in good favor. So we've got, to, we've got to understand that so many religions, so many, different, uh, so many different people are trusting in that to get them to heaven. To die to the law is to renounce it and to be freed from its dominion. And so, <clears throat> so that we've had no confidence in it, we're not trusting in it, uh, we're not uh, in bondage, because ultimately what ends up happening is we trust in the law and we rely on the law. In other words, our goodness, our good works, what we have done, we rely on that in order to give us favor uh, with God. And what it ends up doing is turning into uh, making us a slave to it. <clears throat> you know, if you're, let me, let me, I want to say this carefully. I don't want it to be misunderstood. If your faith, if your religion, if your Jesus does not set you free, instead it puts you in bondage, you're following the wrong Jesus. You have the wrong faith. You see, Jesus did not come to enslave us and to shackle us. Ooh, this is good stuff, ladies and gentlemen. You look a little excited. I don't know if you are. You better get there. You should get there, rather. Uh, the reality is, Jesus didn't come to shackle us into, our, into the law. He came to set us free from the law. And a lot of people are living shackled to it. The problem with this, with James in the Word of God, if I can say the problem with, with certain men with James was that in, in, in the book of James, as he was writing, is there was not thinking and living as if they were dead to the law. Uh, you know, for them, they were still alive under the law and they believed keeping the law would make them accepted by God. And so he talks about that in the book of James. You see, not only were they living under the law, but they were also wanted uh, the Gentiles to live under the law. And that's what they were trying to accomplish. And so he said, <clears throat> for I live, excuse me, let me read it. For I, through the law, am dead to, to the law that I might live unto God. When Paul died to the law, then, are you ready? Then he could live unto God. When he died to the law, when he died to the flesh, when he died to himself at that moment, that's why it's, it's almost, it's a conundrum here in verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Now, when you think about being crucified, you think about being dead, right? So he says, I'm crucified with Christ. But then he says in the next statement, 
What does he say? Nevertheless, I live. Wait a second now. How can you be crucified? How can you be dead but still be alive? That's a wonderful, wonderful thing, and we're going to cover that tonight. But that is something that could only happen through Jesus Christ. That's not going to happen through Muhammad and and all these other different uh, false religions. That is something that could only happen because of what Jesus Christ did for us. As long as Paul still tried to justify himself before God with all of the law keeping, he was dead. He was dead. But when he died to the law, then he could live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Again, Paul anticipated a question from those who disagree with him. Hey, Paul, when did you die to the law? <coughs> you look, you look, pre- wait a minute, you died. Okay, you look pretty alive to me. I don't know, I don't know how you're dead. Well, Paul was happy to answer that. He said, hey, hey, how, how are you dead? You look, hey, hey, you look alive, Paul. How, how are you dead? And you could imagine him responding back. I have been crucified with Christ. I died to the law when Jesus died on the cross. He died in my place on the cross. So it's like I, excuse me, it was like uh, it, was, uh, it was me up on the cross and he died and I died to the law when he died. <clears throat> and then he says, look at verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Since since we died with Christ on the cross, we have a different life. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a different life. We are saved. We, if I could, if I could, if I could just you know, without looking like one of those clapping monkeys, uh, if I could, if I could just say up here and get your attention that we do not have to live uh, in slavery and bondage to uh, this world, to our flesh, we do not have to do that. Our old life lived under the law, and it's dead. Now we are alive to Jesus Christ, and Jesus is alive inside of us. When the world looks at me, what do they see? I hope they see Jesus. I'm dead. I'm crucified with Christ, but I live. Why? Because Christ liveth in me because I have him on a daily basis. When I feel like I'm struggling and I feel like I'm having just a bad day, I'm having one of those type of, of days. Hey, I've got Christ living in me. You have that promise. And I love this. And he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith and we'll stop, I'll stop at that moment. We'll cover the rest, but let me stop there. In the life which I now live, I live by faith. Paul can only manage the new life Jesus gave him by faith. By faith. You see, people will question what you believe. People will question your thought process. People will question where you stand. And can I encourage you in here today, uh, simply by this, uh, that what we believe comes through faith. So many people want to have all of this scientific evidence of laying out everything, which you can give to some degree. But the reality is we don't go to Jesus because we've got all of the evidence uh, and, and all of this stuff. We come to him by faith, by faith. You see, what happens is when you're not grounded in your faith, when someone comes along and questions your faith, instead of saying, well, let me let me dig into this deeper, Maybe this wasn't covered in discipleship. Maybe I was never taught this, uh, but let me research it. You can research the fact that Jesus was crucified is a historical documented fact. It did happen. And so when somebody tries to question it or tear it down, you can say, no, I've got proof. It's right here. (coughs) In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. You cannot live the new life Jesus gives on the foundation of just keeping the law. Of just being, uh, I'm just going to keep the law and I'm going to be just fine. No, that's, that's not what he is saying. You can only live it by faith. 
I'm going to get to heaven because I've kept this, because I've done this, because I've gone here, I've been baptized, I've been to the church, I've prayed, I've done this, the preacher prayed over me, all that stuff. You know, I make it very, very clear. I've, I've preached at a number of funerals for my family. You know that through the years, uh, being the pastor, <laughs> only pastor in the family. Uh, but I've made it very, very clear at those, at those funeral services when I go up and I say, you, when you stand before God, uh, and, and if, you know, the reality is, if you think you're going to go to heaven because uh, you know me, because Nathan's your cousin, or your, your, your uncle or your nephew, uh, that's not going to cut it. <clears throat> You're not going to get there because you put in the time at church every Sunday morning for 50 years. Hey, I, I, you've heard those people. I've put in my time. I've, I, I don't need any more church. I've put in my time. I went to church three times a week when I was a kid up until I was 18. I've got enough church to last me a lifetime. No, no, yeah. Listen to me now. That's, that is a totally different story in that subject. The fact is we are the body of Christ. There's no such thing as I put in too much time at church or enough time at church. Hey, we're the body. We're to be a part of it. We're to be active in it. We're to be a moving part, functioning part of the church. When Paul said, I now live in the flesh, he didn't mean that he lived this, this sinful life. When we think about that, we think about the flesh. We always think about that in a negative way. Uh, but we're thinking about that term flesh that he uses. Paul does not under, uh, understand uh, you know, or manifest a bunch of vices. You know, He calls sin what they are, adultery, fornication. By flesh, Paul understands uh, what Jesus meant uh, in, 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 in John chapter number three, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Flesh here means the whole nature of man. It is inclusive uh, of the instincts of everything going on. Uh, this flesh, you know, Paul's talking about is not justified by the works of the law. We're putting our faith in Jesus Christ and by, through faith, through faith. The focus of this verse isn't flesh either, by the way. A lot of people focus into that in verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. <clears throat> and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith. I live by the faith. And so faith is the key focus of this verse. Faith is not simply a topic uh, that Paul preached from time to time. Uh, this was the central part of what takes us to heaven. This is the central part of what connects us to our Savior is faith. Faith. Someone said faith should so intimately connect us with Jesus that he and us, he, he and, and, and we become one person through our faith. And can I say that is ultimately uh, in the sense of what happens when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. He takes up residence through the Holy Spirit, takes up residence inside of us. We have that, that privilege of having the Holy Spirit with us, guiding us, directing us through our life. But he says in verse number 20, <coughs> I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. And then let's finish that out of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the faith Paul lived by was not faith in himself. Paul was not relying on his goodness, on his faith in what he could do. He wasn't relying on faith in the law. He wasn't relying in faith in what he could earn or deserve before God. It was faith in a particular person, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, he said, who loved me and gave himself for me. Before Paul's relationship with God was founded on what, what, what he could do for God, his faith was in himself. Before we trusted Christ, we had faith in something else besides God. And most of the time it's in ourselves in that we feel what we're doing is good. We're accomplishing this. We're, we're doing this. And that's often how we feel and how we live. Uh, his faith was ultimately in himself like, like, like ours is many times before we're saved. So now the foundation was what Jesus Christ has done for him. Now the focus isn't on, and now that he's saved, the focus isn't on what I have done or what I'm trusting in. I'm trusting in the law. Now that focus has changed uh, and he is now trusting in the foundation of Jesus Christ and what he has done and already done for him. His faith was in 
Jesus. And Paul found that this marvelous person to be put to put his faith in uh, was something better than him trusting in himself because he realized uh, that is in his flesh is no good thing. What dwells on the inside of us naturally is no good thing. <clears throat> and so he turns to Jesus Christ who loved him and gave himself for us. So who, who loved me? Paul could confidently give himself to Jesus because of the love that Jesus had demonstrated for him in time past. In a moment in time that had already passed. It's true that he loves us now, but Paul also wrote, who loved me. The verb is in past tense. Jesus loved me upon the cross, loved me in the manger of Bethlehem, loved me before, uh, before the earth ever was. There never was a time when Jesus did not love you and me. This was not something that he just suddenly loved us when he got on that cross. No, he loved us before the foundation of the world. And he gave, he gave himself. Did the law ever love me? Did the law ever sacrifice itself for me? You know, when you think about it, and what we're trusting and placing our faith in, we put our faith in something besides Jesus Christ and it's shifting sand every time. Hey, the law didn't die for me. It really, on the opposite, if we want to get technical with this thing, what does the law do? It accuses me. It frightens me. The Bible says our schoolmaster, it drives us crazy. Somebody else saved me from the law, from sin and death, and brought us unto eternal life. That somebody is the Son of God. That is Jesus Christ. And he is ultimately the person who we are to rely on and trust in. But this dying to self is something that we must realize uh, that we have to do on a daily basis. We need to trust in Jesus Christ, dying to our flesh, crucifying our flesh, uh, and following Jesus. He's already done all the work for us. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. What Jesus did for me and you on the cross is what allows us to be saved. I know that's foundational, uh, but we cannot, we should not get used to that or just overlook that. What he did on the cross is what gives the ability for us to get saved. But it's not just the fact that he died on the cross, because if all we had was the death of Jesus, that wouldn't be enough. Hey, there had to be a resurrection, and that's something only God could do. And he raised from the grave. And therefore... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I won't turn there tonight, but if you read through 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, you will find all of this in that text. It's, it is the, the gospel in a chapter. It's really, really good stuff and rich doctrine if you go and read that some other time. But Christ's death for us is our salvation. What made that possible? <clears throat> our death with Christ is, is our sanctification. Jesus' death for me is my salvation. It was wonderful. It was undeserving. Uh, but my death with Jesus is my sanctification. It, it's a continual process that provides victory in my Christian life. If I, if I strive to be more like Jesus, uh, I must be crucified with him. And, and that is exactly what Paul did in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31. He says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. I die daily. <clears throat> it's interesting with our text verse here tonight. Paul doesn't simply say that he died with Christ. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he wrote that he was crucified with Christ. To be crucified involves a lot of pain, a lot of agony. This verb offers an entirely different perspective to the process of dying to self. Many of us are more afraid of how we're going to die rather than death itself. 
I have to admit, when I go to Kings Island and we get on that roller coaster and we're at the very, very top of that, that, that thing, uh, for the first time my wife talked me into getting on uh, Wind Seeker. Does anybody know what that is? It's that one where you're like, you're, you're, you're seated, your feet are dangling, and they take you up to the top, like the drop zone thing, and then you're just spinning, and you just spin and spin and spin, and you're like hundreds of feet in the air. Um, <clears throat> at that moment, I have my get right with Jesus moments. I'm like, Lord, if there's any unconfessed sin, I'm getting it right now because if this thing breaks, uh, as soon as I hit that ground, I'm coming up. <laughs> I'm going to see you today. And uh, we have those moments, don't we, where we say, all right, now, if, if, if something's not right, I want to get it right right now. But some of us are more afraid of how we're going to die than, than, <clears throat> than death itself. For many, death is not what is scary. It's, it's the process of dying. Okay? But just as Jesus suffered dying on the cross, so will we suffer in dying to self. Being crucified with Christ involves surrendering. How, does it, how, how is this a painful process, preacher? Well, if you want to write some things down, you can write this down. When we surrender, our, uh, when we die to self, when we crucify ourselves with Christ, we're surrendering our fleshly desires. Our fleshly desires, our sinful tendencies, our old nature. Now, I can go into a thousand different things off of that, but I'm not going to tonight for sake of time. Uh, but just taking those three areas that I gave you, uh, that we are surrendering our fleshly desires, our sinful tendencies, our old nature. This is not an easy process. And when you start to uh, focus on these things, I'm going to die to self in this area because I want to live a surrendered life for Jesus Christ. It's not easy. Our flesh will want to convince us that we need to allow fear and anger and lust and envy and pride to live in our hearts. And that is simply not the case. <clears throat> you know, our flesh, our flesh loves our sinful tendencies. Do you realize that? Our flesh loves it. That's why he talks about the fact that it needs to die daily. Our flesh loves these things and we must we must surrender them to Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul said in Romans chapter 7 and verse number 18. Uh, we will most likely understand the inward battle he faced as he struggled with his flesh. Let me just read it. Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, beginning of verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. I, said, I quoted that earlier. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do, that I, would, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. <clears throat> but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And verse 25 is, is key there. He said, with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You see, the flesh, or when I say flesh crucified, I'm not saying we literally go crucify ourselves to a cross. <laughs> I hope you understand that and you know that tonight. If you're listening in, make sure that I'm clear on that. It's the flesh. It's what's on the, what's on the inside. What, 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 is, what causes us to want to do wrong when we know it's wrong and we should do what's right? <clears throat> you see... This was, this was one of the hardest, let me, let, me, let me say this, one of the hardest things for me, Brother Heag, when I got saved, when I heard the gospel, see, my upbringing was totally different. I grew up around drinking and drugs and alcohol and, and, and all kinds of things I can't even mention here tonight, but I grew up around all this stuff, and when I grew up, when I was a young boy, I was never taught any of those things were wrong. I was taught that there was nothing wrong with it. And so when I got into the service and the preacher was preaching the word of God and the Holy Spirit conviction started pounding on me, I was like, what? When I said it took me months for me to get saved because of pride, you know why? Because I had to admit what I had been taught was wrong, that it wasn't right. 
And so the Holy Spirit, each week I'd go home like, man, he said that he said we can't partake of that and this is wrong and this is a, and I'm sitting here going home and my mind was just spinning as a 12 year old boy thinking, wait a second, I, I, what's wrong with that? But when the Bible says <laughs> these things are wrong, they're wrong. And just as important, if I can say that, the Holy Spirit working on our hearts saying, hey, should you be doing that? Is that okay? <clears throat> That's why, you know, I think, I think sometimes where we can get this, we can get this so, so kind of off balance sometimes is the things that we, the things that the Holy Spirit convicts us to stay away from may not be as big of a temptation or even a temptation for somebody else. It, it, it may not be. Somebody who is, who is, you know, maybe have been a drinker their whole life and an alcoholic, basically, and, and for them to be around that, it's a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. I've got friends in, uh, who are, who are uh, you know, going through the re rehabilitation process and going through all of that, trying to get off of the drugs. Uh, and one of the things that they don't want to do is they don't, if they truly want to get off of it, is they do not want to go around the same people that tempted them with the stuff in the first place. <clears throat> now, is it wrong for them to be around those people in and of itself? No, it's not. But that temptation being there may be best for them to not. 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. Rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. <clears throat> Is there suffering in life? Yes. You don't, you don't have to be a spiritual giant or the, the exact opposite to realize that there is suffering that comes with this life. There is. Galatians 2.20, I'm almost finished here tonight. He said in verse, in verse 20, a little bit through there, he says, Nevertheless, I live, <coughs> yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This section of the verse seems to have this paradox of I'm crucified and nevertheless I live because, because of our funeral, <laughs> because of our funeral to our flesh, we have life. Does that make sense? I'm trying to think of how to explain it a different way. Because we, we have a funeral every day for our flesh, we have life. Because of our funeral, we have life. By dying to ourself and our old nature, we have this new life in Jesus Christ. Uh, and let me tell you, that is transforming right there. Romans chapter 6 and verse 8, Now if I be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. That's exciting. Verse number 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that right there, can I just share with you, when I get so excited, and you've probably heard me a billion times say, I'm never going to die. When I take my last breath, I'm going to step out of this body and go right on living. But you know what's so great about that? Listen to me now, church, uh, those of you listening online, that eternal life started for me in June of 1997, the moment I trusted Christ, it does not start the moment I take my last breath. I have eternal life right now. And if you're a born-again believer, you have eternal life right now. How comforting is it to know that your life is not defined by your old man? And I don't mean ladies or husbands. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the old flesh the old you before you were saved. Before you met Christ, 
Our identity is in our new life in Christ. We are alive in him. So whatever you were before you got saved, a drug head, an abuser, a fornicator, an adulterer, whatever the case is, whatever you were pre-salvation, can I encourage you in here today that that is not who you are? Can I say that if you are saved now and and, and those strongholds have gotten a hold of you, those things plus more that I've just mentioned, can I say in here that that is not what defines you? What defines you is your relationship and your newness of life in Jesus Christ. And that is who you are. Who are you? I'm a born again child of God. Many people go to the Reformers Unanimous, which I think is a great thing. Many people go to different, you know, addiction helps. And I think there's good in in pretty much all of them. There's some good somewhere in them. And they try to bring out what is, what what do you have? I remember when I was just a young boy, I remember I was probably, um, I was probably about nine or ten years old when my mom was noticing some things that was different about me. Tourette's syndrome, it ended up being Tourette's syndrome, but they didn't know what that was. They just like, man, something's up with him. I mean, his eyes are wigging out and, you know, he's just crazy. Always, I was always washing my hands. I mean, I was talking to some folks after Sunday morning with all this COVID stuff uh, where everybody's, you know, trying to keep clean. And I'm like, that was me before COVID. I, I was, that was just part of my Tourette's syndrome. <clears throat> but I remember going in there and them defining me as, yes, this is you. You have this. And I remember them giving my mom a list of things to prepare for of how I was going to be, how, if it progressed worse, that that, that, that was going to define what I was. Here, here's your one of the, you know, here's you a here's you a free SSI check to to deal with this. And here's all this. And I'm so thankful my mom didn't take any of that stuff. That's not, hey, I am not Tourette syndrome. I'm Nathan Lang, but even more than that, I'm a child of God. Don't define yourself by your your problem, by your addiction. That is not who you are. You are not alcohol. You are not drug abuser. If you're a child of God, you've got something that needs to die. And it's that flesh. It's that old nature. You know, when we die to ourselves, our flesh will try to convince us that we can't function without our old nature. This is, this is who you are. No, nope. Nope, that's not me anymore. That's not me. But through this funeral that we have every day, we can become victorious over that old nature. We're no longer the servants of sin. And can, you know what's so great about dying daily is guess what? Sometime, this is Wednesday, guess what? From now until this Sunday, guess what? Everyone in this room, everyone listening to me right now, you're going to mess up somewhere, somehow by this coming Sunday. But you know what's great about dying to self and crucifying our flesh daily is tomorrow's a fresh start. Tomorrow's a new day. Ah, man, I sp- Wish I wouldn't have talked to that person that way at work. Hey, it's okay. Guess what? We've got time. You, hey, tomorrow's a new day. Get right with God and get right with them. <clears throat> you know, if you can remember the apology that was never given to you, then you haven't forgiven. Did you get that? Well, I'll forgive that person when, no, Christ says, you forgive them now. You forgive them now. You, you know, uh, I don't mean to get off subject here tonight. You don't have to trust somebody to forgive somebody. Trust has nothing to do with forgiving them. You forgive, when, when, somebody, when somebody crosses you, somebody hurts you, somebody's done you wrong, you forgive them immediately because it is only at that moment that you forgive can the process of reconciliation even begin to start. And you've heard this said, I'm sure, when you forgive somebody, it's more for you than it is for them. To release them of what they've done 
That was free. I won't charge you for that tonight. <coughs> yes, I am. Take up an offering. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> In the Old Testament, God allowed the children of Israel to cross two bodies of water on dry land, the Red Sea, and the Jordan River. The Red Sea is a picture of what? Anybody know? Salvation. As God delivered his people from Egypt, the Jordan River, what, anybody knows what the Jordan River is a picture of? Sanctification. Sanctification. As God allowed his people to enter into the promised land and victory, through many times we forget about the crossing of the Jordan. We're so excited about the crossing of the Red Sea, picturing salvation, but what about that sanctification, that, that crossing of the Jordan? It was no less of a miracle than the crossing of the Red Sea. Often we think of salvation as only a miracle in our Christian lives, but, but, but thinking about the mortification of the flesh and life through Christ, it's equally powerful. When we die to self, we die to that lust. You know, the word lust could be defined as any sinful longing, any inward sin in our hearts or minds that causes us to drift from God. In our society, we consider lust to be a, a physical or a sexual desire, but this is, this is not exclusively uh, what we're talking about. The things that the old man wants to see, the places he wants to go, and the things he wants to experience are all included in this death. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Every wicked thought that holds us, every bitter thought that eats us up, every worry that overcomes us, we need to die to. We need to die to. <clears throat> and you have to decide what that is in your life. I can't decide that for you. Your best friend can't decide that for you. Not only does the old man have our, our old nature have wrong desires, but it also has a wrong way of thinking. You see, the way that we're thinking now as a Christian should be different than the way we think when we're, we were lost. You see, when we were lost, we were living for self. We were taking care of number one. Doesn't mean we weren't a good person. Didn't mean we didn't look out for other people. But now that we're saved, we're looking to Christ. He is who we're trying to please. He is our goal. He is who we're looking toward, not our own selfish desires. You see, we're worried about now. We're, we're focusing on, hey, what is God's will? What does God want? <clears throat> I like what one person said, don't ask God to guide your steps if you're not willing to move your feet. <laughs> we die to self. Die to self. Remember Dr. Lee Robertson always doing it. You need to die to self. <clears throat> A lot of people get easily easily offended. Maybe that's something you need to die to self on. You need to die to self. Dr. Bobby Robertson was with Lee Roberts, or excuse me, he was with Lester Roloff and he was telling a joke and he looked up and he said, oh, he said, I'm, I'm sorry if I, that offended you. And Lester Roloff looked over him and he said, I'm dead. He said, you can't offend something that's dead. In other words, what he was saying was, this morning when I woke up, I got myself on my face with God. I made sure I was right with God. I crucified myself right there. He didn't allow everything to bother him. He didn't allow everything to deter him. He just simply wanted to serve Jesus. And you know what? Sometimes people are going to say things that aren't nice. You don't quit because of that. <laughs> You don't quit because you had a hard day. <laughs> Sometimes we want to quit, don't we? We 
can't. <clears throat> I'm in a lot of different pastoral groups, private groups on Facebook, where we encourage one another, talk to one another. <clears throat> and within a certain mile radius, they had calculated that 30 pastors in the past few months have resigned their church and walked, not just resigned their church, but took a different vocation, said, I can't take it anymore. I just thought, wow, that's absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. <clears throat> what I say is, you may be thinking about quitting your wherever. Don't quit. Don't quit. Hey, listen, every day, I'm just, I've, I've literally, I've been at people's bedsides, and I say that, I'll have to say this. I've been at people's deathbeds. They say, I'm ready to just go home. They're talking about heaven. They say, I'm just so tired of fighting. And I bet you many of you in here have probably heard somebody say that. I'm just tired of fighting. Like, can I say that there is a fight? There is a suffering. But it's worth it. But it's worth it. Let's have everybody bowed and every eye closed and we'll be finished tonight. <coughs> Lord in heaven, we do thank you for this day. I pray that we would leave here, Lord, challenged but encouraged through the word of God. Lord, I pray that we would die to self. And just right now, maybe, maybe we woke up this morning and we were just busy, <clears throat> and I know it happens. Wake up late, and we just got to get out the door, and we forget to spend any time with you at all. And all of us go through that. Maybe right now, if we didn't die to self this morning, help, I pray right now in our seats, right there at home, those of you watching, that right now you just die to self. Say, Lord, forgive me of this. Help me to follow you. Help me to stop following the old flesh, the old man. Help me to follow you. And Lord, as we wake up this, tomorrow morning, I pray that we would do the same, that we would crucify this flesh, our desires, our wants, our lusts, our pride, that we would just crucify it, nail it to the cross, Lord, so that we can serve with you. Father, I pray that you would be with each of those people we prayed for tonight, some of them with cancer, some of them with other issues, test results, Father, we're praying for your guidance and your will in those situations. Lord, keep us safe as we travel home. I pray you'd bring us back safely this coming Sunday for Mother's Day, and that we'd have just a great attendance, and that you would be uh, ultimately glorified through it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Fellowship as long as you want. <laughs>